After a moment of staring, the Terra Velt both swung themselves into the air, and with a few flapping strikes of their wings, they glided over towards Shida. Surprised by this, the Rushkak soldiers that were accompanying them quickly hurried after their charges. Shida took a step back as the winged amphibians landed before her, and the humans that surrounded her looked down at these new arrivals with mild curiosity. No doubt, the teal-coloured amphibian then croaked, as they looked up at the group of high-class death worlders. They seemed slightly nervous, however were clearly emboldened to act by some currently unseen factor. You are those people from the news. While Shida still stared down at these strange visitors with a very bad feeling in her stomach, Sam, Nia and Tuya exchanged some confused glances with each other. Well, we have been on the news quite a lot, Sam finally mumbled in confirmation, and shrugged her shoulders. She seemed pretty relaxed, most likely because there wasn't really a sign of hostility from these two off-worlders, and even if there had been, it seemed unlikely that they would have been able to cause any real damage, even if they tried. All right then, the teal-coloured Terravelt continued speaking, as their face turned a lot firmer than before, and it sounded like their croaks were meant to sound more authoritative now. Where are they? They? Sam asked. I looked around again, earning general shrugs. She didn't say anything on the topic, even though she had a good idea who those two were referring to. I'm afraid I don't know. Ah, Kaliomi! The other, pinkish Terravelt then exclaimed, and took an aggressive yet utterly unintimidating step forwards, while extending their colourfully patterned wings in what seemed to be intended as an intimidating display. Who else could we possibly be referring to? The group got quiet for some time, most likely both because they didn't appreciate these off-worlders trying to physically impose them, and also because they didn't see a point in simply repeating that they had no idea who exactly Kaliom was, as the name rung absolutely no bells. That was except for Shida, of course. She knew that name. She had heard it only very recently. For a moment, she wondered if she should just play dumb. However, in the end, that was rarely really helpful. They're not really using that name anymore, she said, and crossed her arms while looking down at the two new arrivals with suspiciously narrowing eyes. And if you saw us on the news, I can only surmise that you absolutely know that. The eyes of the teal-coloured Terravelt now narrowed again. Don't use that name anymore? Don't be ridiculous. It's their name, they hissed out of their wide mouth. Behind herself, Shida could hear Nia make a disparaging clicking sound through her teeth at that statement. Well, you're not going to find a Kaliyo anywhere around here, Shida simply repeated her earlier statement and kept her arms crossed. In the meantime, the Rushkak soldiers that were accompanying the Terrafelt had fully caught up to them. The large insect toys that towered over Shida in size offered way more of physical presence than the amphibians that were trying to impose her here. However, they too were not going to intimidate anyone. The teal-coloured Terrafelt opened their mouth to speak again, but was quickly held back by the other one who quickly stepped forward, in a meeker display than before this time. Their wings remained folded, and they slightly lowered their head. Please, they croaked, careful not to raise their voice while still sounding urgent. It seemed someone had realised that they weren't going to strong-arm a group of high-class death worlders into doing anything. We're just worried, and we really want to see them. Some of the humans, even without fully knowing what exactly was happening, seemed to slowly catch on to the key factors of this conversation, without needing an explanation. After what you've just said, there's a pretty good chance they don't want to see you, Nia commented under her breath, and crossed her arms similarly to Shida. Shida nodded, now entirely taking the lead in this conversation. Yeah, and besides, what's up with the escort? She asked suspiciously, and eyed the two Rouge Gak for a second. Not quite sure why something like that would be necessary, 
for simply seeing them. The large insectoids, not possessing the necessary vocal organs that were needed to speak galactic uniform, as the soldier morph of their species, clicked at each other for a moment. They are just here to ensure everything will be handled peacefully, the pink Terravelt tried to say calmingly, still putting on that same submissive display from before. Listen, maybe you are misunderstanding the situation, but we mean no harm. We are their parents. Yes, I figured. Shida interrupted them, unimpressed. The Terravelt flinched slightly as they were shut down. However, that only invigorated the other one once again. Yes, we are Kelly M's parents. They're guardians. We are responsible for them. So you better tell us where they are right now before we have to make you... You... They exclaimed. However, that voice was entirely cut off as the gaze of every single Death Worlder around, including their own escort, suddenly snapped onto them with a blindly quick head movement. Go on, Sheeta said. Her yellow eyes now burning down at the much smaller person, with a fiery passion. We what? Say it to my face. They did, in fact, not say it to her face. Instead, they fell quiet, but visibly seemed to stew in their own resentment of the people in front of them. We've just gotten off to the wrong start, the pink terror felt, and presumably the partner of the other one quickly tried their best to even remotely salvage the situation with calmly raised hands. Let's just all calm down and... And maybe introduce ourselves first. They paused momentarily to clear their throat, as they opened up their posture more to appear welcoming. I am Ferian, they introduced themselves, before pointing at the teal coloured Terravelt. And this one is my mate, Cole Hoffer. And as you have already surmised, we are Calliome's parents. They looked up at Shida, hopefully. However, she just stood there suddenly judging them with a sharp gaze. Nervously swallowing, Fairy Anne was still undeterred from her attempt and added, Who... Who might we have the pleasure with? Sheeda tilted her head slightly. She was pretty sure that those people who had recognised her specifically from seeing her on the news definitely knew her name. Still, she then sighed for a moment and decided that she didn't want to appear entirely unreasonable here, even if she still had anything but a good feeling about where this was leading. Lieutenant Commander Shida of the UHSDF, she introduced herself briefly. With me are Captain Samantha Anderson, First Lieutenant Tuya Batar, and Nia Zubira. Farian nodded their wide head. Lieutenant Commander, I'm sure your time must be incredibly valuable, and we apologise for taking up so much of it, but we would really like to see our child. After everything that has happened, we are incredibly worried about them, they explained. Sheeda could almost smell it on them. Their growing resentment. They weren't any better than their partner, they were just a lot better at hiding it and packaging it up nicely. But she could still see it right there, just under the surface. These weren't good people. She could feel it and her stance firmed up even more as this slimy creature in front of her was trying to butter her up like this. However, after a moment, she felt someone lean in towards her. With the output of the amplifiers in her breath filter turned down to its minimum, Sam whispered right into her ear. Just so I'm not fully off base, this is about Curie, right? She assumed quietly, seemingly wanting to confirm what she already suspected, before getting out what she really wanted to say. Shida nodded subtly. Sam then turned her head to look at the two amphibians in front of them for a second. The pixelated facsimile of a face that was projected onto her visor didn't really give away her thoughts on the matter as she studied them for a moment. But ultimately she sighed. I get what you're doing, she then whispered to Shida again. Really, I do, but shouldn't we let Curie decide if they want to see them or not? For a moment, Sheeda's arms flexed as she tightened her stance even further, in an instinctual burst of almost childish defiance. However, after just a moment, she quickly relaxed again, breathing out her building tension with a long, drawn-out exhale. Yeah, you're right, she admitted. 
She didn't trust these people, not one bit. And honestly, she didn't want them anywhere near Curie. But Curie was an adult, and fully capable of making their own decision. Sheila couldn't see why they would have any desire to meet with their parents, but the decision was still theirs to make, and she couldn't be 100% certain of it without hearing it out of their own voice box. You're right, Sheila repeated herself with a nod, and then looked directly at Sam. They're at your room, right? Sam nodded as well. I'll go see what they have to say on the matter, she then confirmed, and peeled away from Sheeda to walk back to the room Sam and Curie shared during their stay here. Sheeda then looked down for a moment as she pulled out her phone. This wasn't really an emergency or hands on deck kind of situation, but she did still feel like she should very quickly post at least the cliff notes into their shared communications, just so everyone was aware and on the same page. However, her attention snapped slightly upwards again when she noticed movement in her periphery, as the Terravelt had seemingly started to walk. Following their movement, it soon became clear that those two intended to follow Sam as she was leaving. Quickly, Sheeda stepped into their way. That one's going to Calio, isn't she? Cora Hoffer accusingly exclaimed as Sheeda blocked their path. Sheeda refused to move out of their way. Whenever they tried to take a step, she would immediately block the way again. We'll let Curie decide themselves if they want to see you or not. She then very simply informed the pair in brief and no uncertain terms. Cora Hoffer then narrowed their eyes at Sheeda again, their gaze turning so venomous that not even a Ligamordala would have touched it with a free measure pole. If Kalio is in there, then you have to let us to them, they warned in a deep croak. Sheeda's ear flicked once as she tilted her head to the side and raised an eyebrow mockingly. I have to, she questioned, in an utterly unconvinced tone. However, the Terravelt seemed surprisingly sure of themselves, which gave her a moment of pause. You have to, Cora Hoffer confirmed for Sheeda and now some morbid amusement seemed to be mixing into their utter loathing of the people they had to speak and deal with here. They then lifted their small arm, to which a personal assistant was securely strapped. We have a signed and certified court order right here that certifies us as Calium's official legal guardians, as well as their conservators. You have the legal duty and obligation to bring us to them right now. Next to him, Fairy Anne stepped up carefully. Karahoffer, they tried to calm him for a moment, seeming a bit apprehensive about this very direct approach. However, Karahoffer pulled their arm away as Fairy Yan tried to reach for it. No, they exclaimed with a shake of their white head. I am done playing nice with these creatures. We have a duty to take care of Kaliom, and I will not have them getting in the way. Every second we leave our child with them is one that further poisons their mind. While Sheeda stared down at the exchange with gradually widening eyes, she could hear movement behind her as someone took a step in their direction. Con- Conservators? You put your child under a conservatorship? And a guardianship as well? Nia asked under her breath, in what sounded like true, utter disbelief for the actions these parents had taken, as she slowly stepped towards them. Sheeda's ears twitched. Although she heard them say it, she admittedly wasn't entirely familiar with those terms. What does that mean exactly? She asked Nia quickly, without taking her eyes off the Terravelt. It means she is our child, and we have to protect her! Cora Hoffer insisted aggressively. However, Sheeda could see Nia shake her head in her periphery. Those are court orders that give someone complete control over your financial and bodily freedom. They basically turn you back into a child, with no real control of your own, putting everything you own, including your own body, under the command of somebody else. She explained slowly, with a lot of emotion clearly bubbling just underneath her relatively calm and collected surface. My... my parents once tried to put me under a guardianship as well, but the court threw the case out, because severe measures like that are entirely reserved for someone who is simply and utterly unable to take care of themselves in any way, shape or form, 
and who needs a guardian like that to make the decisions for them? Getting one from someone who is clearly sound of mind is... She cut herself off, and Tuya quickly stepped to her side. Kiri has never mentioned being under a conservatorship, have they? The green-haired lieutenant asked Shida curiously, and Shida shook her head. No, they haven't, she confirmed hesitantly. They don't talk much about their past, but no. They would have mentioned something like this when they told us what happened to them. They aren't one to leave something like that out. This can't be something that they know about. We went to the courts immediately after we saw Kaliom on the news, standing right behind that human lunatic who spouted something about a peaceful realized in front of the entire galaxy, Fairy Anne said in a restrainingly polite tone. You got this recently? It burst out of near and not a shock. But how? Those procedures take ages. Not only that, but they involve checkups, evaluations, reports, and Curie was with us the entire time. Clearly, things were not adding up. As someone who apparently had to fight off such a procedure herself once, Nia had to know what she was talking about. Still, Cora Hoffer just scoffed at her worries with a smug expression on their face. Oh, please, they said in a tone that was so dripping of malicious enjoyment that it took Sheeda some serious restraint to not immediately physically remind him just who he was trying to provoke here. As if any of that was necessary. The judge and court doctors took one look at them and immediately signed the order. A blind person could see that they aren't of sound body and mind. Sheena could feel her pupils constrict as she heard those words. You, she mumbled, but then quickly took another step to once again block the pair's path as they tried to walk over to the room Sam had disappeared into. Court orders be damned, she wasn't going to let these people anywhere near Curie. It was at that point that Cora Hoffer let out an irritated snarl, before suddenly jumping into the air with extended wings, spiraling in an ascend for a moment, before simply gliding right over Sheeda's head. Sheeda snarled as well, but short of swatting them out of the air, which would most likely seriously injure them, there was little she could do to stop them this time. Not that she didn't have at least some desire to still do it, However, that was about as far from as good an idea as one could get. Fairy Anne remained in place for a moment longer, giving Shida a very clearly judging look for a moment, before also taking off and flying after their partner. Immediately, Shida, Tuya and Nia all turned to follow them. Sadly, it seemed that Sam had left the door to their room unlocked, as she had only planned to check in with Curie for a moment, and her most likely not expected to be followed in this way. Sam shot up, as everyone arrived at the room one after another, with the Terravelt pair being the first to burst into the room. They looked around aggressively, but then almost immediately froze in place as their gazes finally fell onto their child. She did just about caught sight of it as she entered behind them. They were completely petrified. No one except them and Curie knew exactly how long it had been since this family had last come face to face with each other, but it seemed to have been at the very least before Curie's most recent iteration of their body was finished. Sure, they had seen it on recordings before, but as Shida knew from experience, that didn't necessarily prepare you for coming face to face with the real thing. Curie now also perked up as they noticed all the people entering. Their unmoving red eyes stared out of their mask-like face, silver mild red glow. Their metal face was utterly incapable of directly conveying any sort of emotion, but Shida could still feel that the blank stare they had on their face right now wasn't just caused by their eyes' inability to narrow. The cyborg stood perfectly still. Not a single movement swayed their mechanical body. Meanwhile, Sam had jumped up and positioned herself in between Curie and their approaching parents protectively. And after only a moment, Sheeta took a leap down the room's stairs, jumping right over the frozen Terravelt's heads in a wide arch, before landing right next to the captain, building herself up as well. However, as she did her best to make her posture entirely uncompromising, on not getting out of the way, a voice cut through the room. Mish... 
Vor, it said. And Shida couldn't quite believe her ears, as she quickly shot around to look at Kyuri. The cyborg was still completely motionless. However, the voice had most definitely come from them, because Shida knew that voice. It wasn't the cyborg's usual artificial facsimile of one that everyone around here was used to. Instead, they had used their other second voice box. One that was far closer to imitating an organic voice. One that they usually reserved for the use in either telling stories or interacting with people who couldn't see their face as they spoke in an attempt to have a normal customer service interaction over a call. Never, not once, has Shida heard the cyborg decide to use this voice of theirs, just like that in a casual setting. It took a few more moments before the Terravelt pair had managed to shake themselves out of their own stupor. Mucha. Cora Hoffer was the first of the two to speak up. And to Shida's complete and utter shock, she couldn't help but notice that there was what sounded like some actual real tenderness in their voice as they said it. Kaliom, Farian and address Curie, and Shida quickly heard that that same tenderness clearly wasn't there for them. We've come to take you away from these people. Shida shot around with a burning gaze, ready to throw these people out as she had to. However, the sound of clacking coming from metal feet walking across the hard floor of the room gave her pause, as she heard how Curie began to slowly scuttle across the room. Although she didn't really want to, Shida let them pass as they walked past her and Sam, and she saw the cyborg giving both of them a brief, appreciative tilt of their body. They then moved on directly towards their parents. Immediately, Farian took an intimidated step backwards as Curie approached, while Cora Hoffa remained rooted in place and stared up at their child. In this new body of theirs, Curie towered over their conspecifics easily. Although their body was still about the same size as the usual Terravelts, their massive backwards legs lifted it high into the air, far above their parents' heads. That was until Curie slowly lowered their body down, closer towards the ground. Now on almost eye level with them, Curie first looked directly at Cora Hoffa. The... they said. Their voice clearly stained with a tinge of sadness as they spoke. Mucha, Korohoff replied tenderly once again. And although their entire body trembled as they did so, as their mind clearly fought against their actions, they slowly began to lift their hands, reaching towards Curie's metallic face in a gentle motion. Their hands quivered like a leaf in the wind as they came close to making contact, when suddenly... Kaliom! The much firmer voice of Farian called out, surprising Karahofa so much with his intensity that they pulled their hands back in shock as they flinched. Mish, Curie replied slowly. Shida didn't know if they were disappointed that it hadn't come to any contact between them and their vor. However, even their more natural voice had hints of a certain hardness as they switched their attention towards the second Terravelt. Pack your belongings, Kaliom. We are going home, Farian stated firmly, in a tone that didn't exactly invite a response other than yes. However, Curie stared at them for a few moments. Then, very plainly and simply, they stated, No. Farian seemed confused. No, they asked with a tilt of their head. No, Curie confirmed with a nod. I left home for a reason. I am not going back now. Ferian's eyes narrowed slightly. Well, I'm afraid you don't have a choice. The courts have declared us as your guardians, and as such we have the legal right to decide your whereabouts. These people you surrounded yourself with clearly aren't good for you, and especially not for your mental health. Therefore, it is our duty to remove you from their presence. Now go on. Pack up, they said in a venomously polite tone. James had often described the tone that the high matriarch of the Sodiatos had used to speak to him 
during his stay on Ossigenar as a sickly sweet. Right now, she'd have believed that she started to understand what he meant by that. Curie seemed to be rather unmoved by their declaration, however. No, they simply repeated their earlier answer. This in turn caused Farian to repeat themselves as well. Carry home, I already told you, you don't have a choice. Curie seemed unimpressed. I do have a choice, they stated, clear as day. I can simply choose not to go with you. Fairy Anne sighed. Callion, please, don't be so childish, they admonished Curie. If you don't come willingly, they will have to force you. Do you really want that? Do you want us to force you to come with us? Curie pushed themselves up a bit higher with their backwards legs, getting some serious high ground over there, Mish. You can't they then stated from above them, taking a both physical and verbal position of power. Of course I can, Farian tried to say, most likely once again intending to remind everyone of the court order. However, they were interrupted by a voice coming from up the stairs behind them. They're right, you can't, Nia said, and looked down at the terror belt. The pixelated expression on her mask was one of sheer determined spite, as she basically spat the words into the Terravel's face. You can't force them to come with you. You can drag them, carry them off, put them on a leash and pull them along, but you can never force them to come with you. There's a big difference. While Farian turned to indignantly look back at Nia, she'd have chimed up alongside her. Yeah, and if you're planning to try any of those, you're going to have to go through me first, she said determinately. That document you have there is hogwash. I don't care what your judge says. You can't just rob someone of their autonomy just because they want to live a different life than most. Curie is perfectly sane and capable of reason. They have method. Farian replied directly. That alone should be enough to consider twice if they actually know what they are saying. Now look at them. Look at what they've done to themselves. Is that what a sane person looks like? The Farianne's seeming surprise, she actually did what they asked of her. She turned her gaze slightly and took a good long look at Curie, taking in her friend's metal body as it towered over their parent. I don't know what you mean, she then said, and deliberately put a smile on her face as her eyes stuck to her friend. Curie is beautiful. She saw the cyborg's body freeze up, turning completely motionless once again after she said that. You, you're insane! She could then hear Cora Hoffa gasp as their gaze shot back and forth between the feline and their child. She just shook her head. No, she replied firmly. I've simply opened my eyes. Next to her, Sam nodded. And now you two will get out of my room before I lose my patience, the captain then loudly announced and began to step up to the terror belt imperiously. You are not welcome here. You can't, Cora Hoffa started to say, but was forced to back away as Sam made no efforts to stop her pace, as she walked up to the two, forcing the amphibians to either make way or get trampled by the much larger human. Come back with a warrant, Sam then ordered the two. Farianne seemed to take the hint and began to turn, obviously intending to do just what Sam had just told them. However, Cora Hoffa was suddenly emboldened. Calling Sam's bluff, they remained in place, and although they flinched heavily as her foot rose once again, they were indeed correct in their assumption that she wasn't actually going to trample them. Her foot came down right next to theirs, causing them to quiver in place. Nonetheless, they still kept up a defiant look at the human's covered face. That is my child you are talking about! They exclaimed loudly, and clenched their hands into fists. Not some rock in a border dispute. You can't just keep them away from us just because you don't feel like we have the right document. Sam simply stared down at him. She didn't knew, underneath her mask, the captain's blue eyes had turned to literal ice. I can and I will, the human slightly distorted voice said coldly, sounding as mechanical as Curie's usual voice box at that moment. What are you going to do about it? 
You haven't cared about them so far. Why start now? To Shida's surprise, the Teal Terravel did not back off. You. You're the reason, they said under their breath. When it was just them, just Kaliom on their own, I could live with it. They did what they thought best. It was wrong, but I could live with it. But you! They glared up at Sam. With vitriol in their voice, he said, You poisoned their mind, all of you insane people. You. You're putting them in danger. What they did by themselves was bad, but this? Changing the community's norms? Attacking the unity of the people? Fraternization with a realized? And all the while, they're going along with it, because you're all pretending like what they do is... Normal? Nia finished their sentence for them, causing his breath to die in his throat as she unconsciously stomped her foot onto the floor. It wasn't just her. She could feel the same agitation she felt rise up within all the humans around them. Shida took a threatening step in Korohova's direction. You're mad that... that Curie found friends? She asked them, in a low, near-primal growl, as the hairs on her head began to stand up. Her lips lifted into a furious sneer as she spoke. You were fine when they were just miserable and alone, but you can't stand that there are people who love and support them as they are? Before she could take another step, she felt an arm press against her chest. Sam had stopped her approach. She did looked at her, but did not protest. She wasn't actually going to hurt anyone, but maybe it was better if those two thought that she would. Farah Yan then quickly hurried over to their mate, their face now distorted in the most genuine feeling of worry Shida has seen out of them yet. Let's go, love, they said urgently. These people are crazy. They'll hurt you if you keep pushing them. We can't just leave Kellyone with them or they're going to get hurt too, Korohoff replied, in what sounded like an earnestly protective tone. However, their mate urgently reached for their face and pulled it close. We won't, Farian said with one hand on each of Korohoff's cheeks, as they stared intensely into their mate's eyes. We'll come back with the authorities. We'll get our child out of here. But please, don't get yourself senselessly hurt. There's nothing you can do against these people right now. Korohoffer seemed torn and growled under their breath, but ultimately relented. Then they looked over towards Curie. Don't worry, Mocha. We'll be back for you, they said, in what was most likely supposed to be a reassuring tone, before allowing themselves to be pulled to the room's entrance by their mate. Vor... Please don't, Curie said after them, as they watched them leave. Curie remained in place, but Shida and Sam both moved to make sure that the Terravel pair would actually leave. Nia and Tuya both got out of the pair's way as they tried to leave the room. However, as they exited the door at the top of the stairs, the Terravel once again momentarily froze. Wondering what had them shocked this time, Shida moved to quickly look out as well. And what she found was a slightly odd, but also oddly reassuring sight. Andres and Konglorch, who had been in their room doing some work before, had emerged in the meantime. And just outside Curie's door, the two of them stood in protectively built-up postures, staring down the two Rushgak soldiers that had accompanied the Terravelt. Andrej stood firm, but calm. Konglorch, meanwhile, well, despite his naturally slightly monstrous look, Shida had never seen the last Tenestrosite look this, for a lack of a better term, scary before, as he stared with all of his eyes forwards and wide open, and his rows of teeth slightly bared. The giant's long body basically formed a wall that surrounded the insectoids in a semicircle, that reached from the front of his snout to the tip of his long tail. Now, one of his eyes twitched over towards the emerging group questioningly. They were just leaving, she announced to the giant reptile, before using her foot to not so gently nudge the Terravelt out of their shock. Konglor scanned over them for a moment, 
before closing his mouth. With a few steps, he tightened up his posture and freed up the way out of the room and onto the roof. The terror Velt looked up at Sheeta venomously, but did not argue as they began to quickly trudge away from the room. The Rushgat clicked to each other once again, but soon followed their charges away. Don't come back, Konglosh growled under their breath. They will, Sheeta said with crossed arms before turning to Andredge. Any chance we can get someone on trying to overturn that order they have? Andres nodded slowly. Already on it, 